cat. That's okay. <laughs> we like cats. Well. <laughs> we like all animals, Rob. Of course we do. Of course. Of course we do. We do. All right. Even though dogs are better. <laughs> um, that's the secret webinar people didn't know they were attending. Dogs versus cats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> abandoned our original program. <laughs> nope, just kidding to everybody who's logging on right now. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to everyone who's logging in and we're going to get started in just a couple of moments. Hi, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Liz Toth. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations at Dickinson. And I had the pleasure of overlapping at Dickinson tonight with our two speakers. Uh, Rob Webb is class of 2005 and Joellen McBride, class of 2004, who were both physics and astronomy majors at Dickinson. Uh, they, however, first met um, when they were, Rob was a freshman and naively asked the cheerleaders, of which Joellen was one, if there was a red devil costume that he could wear to the games. <laughs> and from there became long lasting friends who would throw things off of the physics, physics building to test their tensile strength and mm -hmm. other fun things and worked together in Alpha Phi Omega as well. And so Rob and Ellen are, or, uh, Rob and Joellen are real life friends who have come together tonight to give this uh, wonderful program for Dickinson. We're thrilled to have you both. Um, as we go throughout the evening, we are definitely taking questions. So please direct those to the Q&A portion. We'll keep an eye on chat as well, but please try to keep an, um, most questions to the Q&A portion of the screen. And with that, I turn this over to our speakers. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, hi everybody. Um, I'm Rob Webb. Um, I'm a uh, high school physics and astronomy teacher in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, down at Peckway Valley. Um, and I, I run a planetarium there as well. And we just did a whole big thing renovating it. Um, and, and it was great. It was wonderful. And one of the things I'm trying to do now in COVID times is actually um, try to bring the night sky to people, even when they're on their laptops. So um, that's kind of where I'm coming at today. Um, Joe, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Joe, Joel McBride. Um, I am currently an associate director of the Graduate Student Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, but I earned my PhD in physics in 2016 from UNC Chapel Hill. So I guess I'm here as like the expert in astronomy, if anyone <laughs> has any burning questions about the universe. Um, I also do lots of outreach. Um, I actually work with the American Helicopter Museum in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and I do some astronomy programming there on the side just for fun. But yeah, I don't really know what else to say about myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I guess we'll um, We'll get started. Um, every month I like to put together a monthly night sky tour on my YouTube page. And um, I do that using a program called Starry Night, which actually I will share with you in just a moment. Um, and so I, I'm looking at this from a beginner's perspective, right? Like what is out there? How about this? If you want to go out and impress your kids with your night sky knowledge, um, what could you show them out there that you can see. Um, and actually, before I do that, um, if you saw the sky this morning, um, actually, this was two mornings ago, but you could see a beautiful crescent moon right there uh, with Venus in the morning um, off to the east. And it was just absolutely gorgeous. Um, let's see, I think, yeah, that, that was a little zoomed in shot. You can see the moon and Venus. Um, and this morning, I know it's probably tough for you guys to see, but there's Venus and there's a very, very thin crescent moon. Um, and these are, this is the type of thing that you can see with your naked eye. 
Um, but let's see, that's not the one I want to show you. I want to show you the Starry Night <clears throat> program. Um, so this is essentially the night sky as it is tonight. Um, and looking at October, October is pretty cool because we have two full moons. I don't know if you noticed October 1st was a full moon. October 31st, Halloween is going to be a full moon as well. Um, we've got four planets that we can see. We've got the Orionid meteor shower, which we'll talk about. Um, and we've got the opposition of Mars. Now, hopefully, um, the sky will agree with us tonight and I'll be able to show you some of the basic, uh, like where Saturn and Jupiter are tonight and show you some constellations as well, live through the camera. This is the first time I'm doing it, so you guys are lucky. Um, and um, yeah, we won't be able to see Mars because there's, this is my deck, because that's where my Wi-Fi is. So the trees are in the way of Mars, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, but yeah, so actually let's start off. If you look at the screen right now, what you're seeing is a little S here, that's for South, okay? And what you can see is all these little, all these constellations up here. And what you notice in the orange is two beautiful planets actually right together. Now, if you go outside with your kids right now, or even later tonight or the next month or so, if you just go out and look to the south, this is what you're going to see. Jupiter's going to be bright and Saturn's going to be a little less bright, but they're going to be the two brightest things in that area. And in fact, let's see if this works. I'm going to show you, if you have me on the camera, you can see those two right now. I'm going to ask Liz, can you, uh, can you see that in the, in the screen? Yes, I can see. Oh, fantastic. All right. Yeah, so if you're looking at that, um, what you're seeing is, is that backwards? I wonder, hmm. Hey, Joe, is the one on the left brighter or dimmer? Dimmer. It looks right. Okay. All right. Thank you. It's reversed on my screen for some reason. It looks like it. Uh, but yeah, so what you see is Jupiter is that brightest one, um, a little bit on the right. And then Saturn is a slightly dimmer one to the left. And they're super easy to find because, again, all you do is look south. And if you don't know where south is, try to think of where the sun sets and turn 90 degrees to the left, and you'll be facing south, okay? So all of October, this is what you're going to see. Now, thinking ahead, uh, what's gonna happen is these are actually going to be moving closer and closer together until December 21st. And on December 21st, um, they're going to be, I think, less than a degree apart, where it's going to be a true conjunction. So what you'll start seeing is every couple nights, it's going to um, just get closer and closer together. Um, and right by Christmas break, it's going to be really, really beautiful. Um, if you have a telescope, definitely take your telescope to see this, because on Jupiter, you can see the cloud bands, you can see four bright dots on either the left or the right or some mix of that. And those are the four Galilean moons, which are the four moons that Galileo first saw in his really rudimentary telescope, <laughs> uh, which is his, his first telescope was, wasn't even as good as a, as a pair of binoculars, of, of, as a pair of kid binoculars. Okay. Um, and then Saturn, of course, you can see the rings. Um, so, so yeah. Um, before I move on from Saturn and Jupiter, um, are there any questions about Saturn and Jupiter? Or um, Joe, did you have anything to, to say about Saturn and Jupiter? Um, I'm not sure if I have anything to say about Saturn and Jupiter, but somebody asked what the, um, the star is up and to the right of Jupiter. And I'm not actually sure because I don't have Starry Night open in front of me to say uh, if that star see. actually has a name. But uh, Rob can show out. that in Starry Night. Yes, I can. Here I go. I'm going to share that screen again. And it looks like it's a Balda. There you go. Um, as you can see, 
in Starry Night, um, the bigger circles are the brighter stars. And uh, yeah, it's called Abalda or Albalda. I don't know. Most of the star names are uh, Middle Eastern. Um, and so I, I don't really have much of a expertise in that. But uh, yeah, there it is. And it's right next to Sagittarius. Um, if, uh, if you see this right here, this is the teapot of Sagittarius right here. So uh, in fact, let me highlight that. There we go. There's the teapot of Sagittarius and you should be able to see that. In fact, um, so you got the handle here, the lid, spout. Um, I wonder if, let's see if I can actually get that. I'm gonna move this, this is dangerous. Let's see. Um, oh wait, I gotta stop sharing. I'm stretching the cords. Uh, you can only really see the handle right below Jupiter. That's about it. But yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's Jupiter and Saturn. So and that's going to be all October. Um, yeah. Any any other thoughts or anything about Jupiter or Saturn? Um, not much. I did just answer a question though. Someone asked. Um, why are Jupiter and Saturn moving closer together? And I just explained that it's because they're both orbiting the sun and from our perspective, it looks like they're getting close together. I'm not sure yeah. which one is catching up with who though, uh, from the top of my head, but. I would guess it's Jupiter because Jupiter is closer to the sun. So it's moving right. faster, right? So. Oh, this is hard to do on Zoom and in front of me. Okay. Um, <laughs> Your head can be the sun. My head's the sun. Okay. <laughs> Th this finger is Jupiter and this finger is Saturn. So what's happening is they're, they're, both, uh, they're both orbiting, but Jupiter's orbiting a little faster. And so they're getting closer and closer in line. And right about here is where they will get really, really close together. That's December 21st. But then I think Jupiter moves past. If I'm, if I'm correct, but yeah, so there we go. Um, now, the other thing that I wanted to show you, oh, I wanted to show you, but I don't think I can show you, but if you went to, if you look at Saturn and Jupiter and you turn 90 degrees to the left and you're outside and you have a pretty good view of the horizon, you're gonna be able to see Mars this month. Now, Mars is going to be, for me, it's right behind me, right behind all those trees in my neighbor's house. Um, they don't like me turning a camera on the house for some reason. So, um, but you'll see it's, it's really bright right now, okay? And it's really bright because kind of like how we we're talking about Jupiter and Saturn. Now imagine my face is the sun again, and this is Earth and this is Mars. What's happening is Earth is catching up and lapping Mars and getting really, really close to Mars comparatively to normal and is passing by. So now Mars is going to look as big as it, uh, as big as it can almost. There's some wiggle room in there, but basically as big as it will for another, I think two years is when this opposition happens uh, every two years. Um, but it's, the, it's not twinkling, it's a bright orange reddish dot. Uh, but yeah, if you're looking at that, it's Mars. Here's, if you take your telescope out though, don't be surprised if it's not that impressive through a telescope. <laughs> Joe, I don't know if you have any experience with, uh, with, with that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, so Mars is, is pretty small. Even though it's close to us, it's still really small. So it's really hard to see details on Mars without like a very big telescope. Now, I did use a um a 16 inch telescope down in chile once and i took a picture with mars and i was it was clear enough that i was able to actually kind of maybe see some polar ice caps but you can only see that at a very specific time of the year and it has to be a very clear night 
and a very steady sky so that you can actually see it. But it was, but it was, it was questionable whether that was what I was seeing. But you need mm -hmm. a pretty powerful telescope to see any detail yeah. on Mars. And actually, speaking of telescopes, somebody asked, which I don't know the answer to off the top of my head, but what power telescope should a beginner get to really, really see Saturn's rings? Ooh, that is a very good question. One that I don't know the answer to the, to the top of, off the top of my head, but I can certainly uh, pretend like I know and give you a general idea. Um, <laughs> uh, in, in general, when you're looking for a beginner telescope, you don't wanna look for one that says how many times it magnifies or anything like that. Like in the toy store, don't, don't get it at Walmart. Maybe walmart.com, I think they have some good ones, but go to like oriontelescopes.com, Orion, O-R-I-O-N. Um, or you could go to my YouTube channel, Mr. Webb PV, and I have a little how to buy a telescope for a beginner video. Um, because you want one from a telescope shop because the ones that they do in toy stores are, I'm sorry, but they're just junk. Uh, they're, they're very flimsy, they flop around, they're, um, they're hard to use. Um, and in fact, um, I would suggest as a first telescope for anybody, one of the tabletop reflectors. They're only about like this big. Uh, they go anywhere from 100, from like 50 up to 200. Or if you get a really good one, you, oh, you can spend as much as you want on telescopes. But um, those are pretty good because if you buy a hundred dollar telescope and you're doing and you're messing or messing around with it with kids, a hundred dollars is not a huge loss in case, you know, the kid gets excited for some reason or, or, or the cat comes across, you know? Um, so I would get one of those, it's called a tabletop reflector. Uh, they're pretty cheap and pretty easy to use and point and shoot. And it's a good starting spot with decent, optics it's not one of those crappy um junky refractors that you'll see in the toy store so yeah and someone oh. just mentioned that they're using binoculars and you can yes. so you can it's just it's just hard with binoculars to like hold yourself steady you know because we we move whether we like it or not so <laughs> so it, it will look elongated if you look at saturn with binoculars but if you want to see like a space between the planet and the rings because there is a definite space between where the rings and the and Saturn are. Um, it, it won't take a really powerful telescope. I'm pretty sure Galileo could see rings. I don't know if he saw the space between them, but when like Galileo used his itty bitty telescope to look at Saturn, yeah. he noticed that there were rings there and mm -hmm. his telescope was not super powerful. Yeah. Um, so it he actually called much. them ears. He, he did. He called them the ears. Yeah. Was, but hey, if that's all you knew, that made yeah. sense. I don't know if he saw the space though between the planet and the rings. I don't know if he I, saw that. I think he had some darkened parts in his sketches, yeah, but I'm not he sure. Might have. I'm, I, can't, I can't remember that off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, A lot of. Some, go ahead. Sorry. Someone else asked about Mars, how high it will get tonight. Oh, I can show you in Starry Night. Mm -hmm. do, 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 do. Share Starry Night. I think it there should get high enough to be above trees, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Jupiter and Saturn are right there. You kind of turn 90 degrees at, oops, get out of there. And there's Mars. I'm gonna zoom out a bit. And let's just move time forward. It actually takes a nice tall arc, which is good. And I think it's the highest altitude right around midnight. And that'll be 54 degrees up. So more than halfway up to the sky, to the zenith. The point straight above you, if you just stand outside and point perfectly straight up, that's the point called the zenith. And so Mars will be more than halfway from the ground to the zenith. Um, and that's actually really good observing. If you actually have a telescope and are doing something, you want to go out there 11 o'clock to 1 a.m. If you have the ability and privilege to uh, sleep then uh, in, in the morning, then yes, uh, that's when you would want to go. So, uh, but it just gets better and better throughout the night. 
All right. Okay. Oh, and then Mars, um, it's highest there. And then if you're looking in the morning, okay, as I move time forward, you notice Mars kind of moves toward the west. Okay, and it's going to be setting in the west uh, right around, oh, there it is, sunrise. Okay. And the great thing about sunrise, um, as you saw in those Instagram pictures I just showed you in a blatant attempt to get you to follow me at Mr. Web PV. Okay. Um, what you'll see is Venus in the mornings. Uh, and in fact, right now, whoop, clicked something. There you go. Technically, you can see it starting at about 4.30 in the morning, but who's up at 4.30 in the morning? Uh, but maybe you're up around 6 a.m. and starting to drive into work. It's going to be there, and Venus is going to be just the brightest object. You can't miss it. It's just absolutely gorgeous, and it's, it's, it's going to be great. Um, that's in the morning. Let's see. And by sunrise, it's about 30 degrees above the horizon, which is pretty high, pretty high. Um, yeah, any questions about Venus and looking at it in the morning or actually about any of the planets? Um, I'm answering a question right now. How far away Jupiter is from Earth? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I'm doing some quick math to figure that out. Wait, I just, is it 45 light minutes? Is that right? Yeah, I think it takes light about 45 minutes. Joe, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, um, I don't I, know that off the top of my head, but yeah, I can well, I, the, <laughs> the, the only reason I knew that is because I looked it up for my class today. Um, oh. I think it's about 45 minutes, light minutes away. So um, I was telling my students today, I said, you know, when you're looking at anything in the night sky, um, what you're really looking at is you're actually looking back in time, which kind of doesn't make sense at first. But if you think about it, Jupiter is so far away that it takes 45 minutes, depending on where we are in the orbit, about 45 minutes for the light to go from Jupiter to our eyes. So that light is actually 45 minutes old or 45 minutes since it was at Jupiter. So you're actually looking at Jupiter as it was 45 minutes ago. For the sun, it's about eight and a half minutes ago. For Proxima Centauri, the next closest star, it's about four light years away. So when you look at Proxima Centauri, you're looking at it, you're looking at it as it looked uh, four, a little more than four years ago. And if you're looking at something like the Andromeda Galaxy, which Let's, let's see. Where'd you go? Well, let's just pretend we're looking at the Andromeda Galaxy as I try to find it. Um, if you're looking at the Andromeda Galaxy, um, oh, it's right around here, actually. Let me put it in there. The Andromeda Galaxy is actually, I believe, two and a half million light years away. And being two and a half million light years away, you're actually looking at the light as it was at the galaxy, as it was two and a half million years ago. So you're actually looking into the past, which is one of the greatest things that I, one of the most awe-inspiring things that I think is in astronomy, uh, where you're looking into the past. You know, the light left Andromeda before I think humans were even humans. Um, I think it was when the dinosaurs were walking. But, um, Joe, any, um, what is it in human years? <laughs> in human years. <laughs> same, same thing. Uh, <laughs> um, any other things there, Joe? Um, let me see. Why is, oh, why is Venus called the morning and evening star? Oh, that's a good question. You want that one or do you want me to take that one? You can take that one because I'm still typing something. Okay, sounds good. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, um, that's very good. So Venus is known as the morning star or the evening star. And one of the reasons is, is that you can only ever see it either in the morning or in the evening, you can't see it in the middle of the night. 
And you might be thinking, well, why is that? And I'm wondering if I can show the orbit. Ah, there we go, perfect. So Venus's orbit is right here. It's in gray, not the best color there. Oh, oh wait, I'm not showing you my screen. I'm sorry. You're not. <laughs> Don't be afraid to yell at me. All right, let's I almost see. did. Okay. So there's Venus, super bright in the morning. Now its orbit around the sun is this gray line right here. And so what you see, especially if I hide, oh, I hid zoom, let's see. Uh, let me hide the horizon there. Where'd it go? There it is, okay. So what happens is Venus is closer to the sun in our, in the orbit, right? So Venus, because it's closer, is only gonna ever orbit the sun like this. It's only, on, it's only ever gonna get about 45 degrees away on one side or the other side. You will never see Venus on one side of the sky and the sun on the other. It always stays close to the sun within about 45 or so degrees. And so, that's why it's either on this side or the other side. Now, right now it's on this side of the sun and there's a relationship between the earth. So it's gonna be a morning planet. And then I think in a couple months, it'll end up being an evening planet when you can only see it in the evening. Now, did that actually answer the question or did I confuse you more? I don't know if, if they can ask a question okay. to your question. I don't know. That's fine. But, but the basic idea is it's, if you look at Earth's orbit, Venus is inside that orbit, so it's not going to stray too far from the sun. That's the basic idea. Yeah. Okay. Also how Galileo proved that <laughs> we orbit the sun and the sun does not orbit us. Yes. But, yes. <laughs> That's another <laughs> lesson that we can do. So, um, Someone actually asked what our favorite thing is to look at through a telescope is. And I said galaxies because mm. I like to imagine that there's, there's some other being in that galaxy looking back at the Milky Way and thinking the same thing. But that was my answer. But I wanted to give you a chance to answer too. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Um, you know, I'll... Uh, hmm. You know what? I think this is going to, I like looking at the moon. I don't look at it all that often, but I do like looking at the moon through a telescope because um, when you look at the moon just with your naked eye, it looks, even, even the line between night and day uh, called the Terminator, that looks very smooth with your naked eye. But if you put a telescope on it, you can see the craters. You can see the damage that has been done by asteroids. Uh, and meteors, and uh, and it changes all the time. You can see different things, um, and and it's easy to find in your telescope. Probably the easiest thing to find. Uh, so I I really like looking at the moon, um, and of course I like looking at the planets. But sometimes you really got to get good um, with the observing with that. But oh, that and eclipses. Eclipses are amazing, and I have. I could do a whole nother webinar on just my trip to see the solar eclipse in 2017. Yeah. But that's a whole nother thing. So. Yeah. So someone, someone just asked, um, when it becomes dark outside, we see something really bright in the sky without a telescope. We just assumed it was a star. Is it possible we are seeing a planet? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, as long as it's not moving, <laughs> yes. If it's if it's moving or blinking, it's probably an airplane. Um, and, and I have been fooled before, even as an astronomy teacher. Um, but typically, if it's staying in one spot and it's brighter than everything around, it quite possibly could be a planet because they tend to be brighter. Uh, or it could be one of the brightest stars like Sirius, which is next to Orion. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, if you're ever out there, you can shoot me a message on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, and 
I might be looking at my phone and, and can help you, but uh, yeah. All right. Okay. We have more questions. People Ooh, are asking awesome. all these questions. This is oh, the I fun part about astronomy. Okay, yes. here's a great one. Um, it says, I see Orion from my home from fall through winter and know that there are many nebula that are part of Orion. Can you help to explain how various celestial bodies come together to form constellations? Absolute luck. Yeah. Would you agree? Yes. Well, constellations are just patterns of stars that we see in the sky. Mm -hmm. um, then when we talk, so when astronomers like to label things, other things that we find in the sky, so like nebulae or galaxies, oftentimes we give them the name of the constellation that we find them in. I mean, the odds of the stars that you see in the sky actually being a part of that nebula are very, very small. Because when we look out in space, to us, it looks like a flat surface, right? But actually there's distance there. So mm. there is an Orion Nebula, you're right. But we call it the Orion Nebula because when we point our telescopes at it, it is behind or it's like behind the constellation Orion, basically. So that's how we can say, oh, there's a nebula out there behind Orion. If you point your telescope there, you'll find it, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and if you look at these stars in Orion called the Hunter, I look at it as a bow tie, but those stars are not all the same distance away. Uh, sorry, I, I have to honor Durden in yeah. some way. Um, but what you see here is like this one, Betelgeuse, is uh, 429 light years away, where nice and orange and red. And then Rigel down here is... 777 light years away. So almost twice as far away as Betelgeuse. Let's see. Uh, the other shoulder, Bellatrix, Bellatrix is 243. Safe is 725. And so you see they're not all the same distance. So they're not part of like one cluster or anything. Uh, if I could show you the 3D model here, I, I would. But basically, they're just sort of in our line of vision. And it's really our human eyes or our human brains, actually, that see that as, oh, hey, look, there's a bunch of stars in one little area of the sky, and they kind of look like they go together. And that's how we got that constellation. They're like, looks like they go together and kind of looks like a hunter. So there we go. There's our constellation. Yeah, but the Orion Nebula is actually like very far away. From us. Yes. It's just very yes. huge and takes up a lot of the sky. So like if you have a really powerful telescope, you can see it, but not with your your eyeballs really. You kind of need a telescope to see most of it. Um I guess you can kind of see it in the belt if you have a pretty low power telescope, I think. But oh, oh, I just lost it. Um Yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, basically what I usually do is I, if I'm looking for the Orion Nebula, I look for his, uh, his sword down here. And that middle thing, and this is something that Galileo saw too, is, is fuzzy. Like it doesn't look like a star. The bottom one is a star, uh, which is Nair al Saif, I guess. And this one is, well, something else. We'll just pretend like I know it. And in here is the nebula. It's fuzzy when you look at it in a telescope, even in a basic telescope you can see a little fuzziness there. And if you have a good telescope, you can actually see the trapezium, the four stars in the middle that really um, uh, kind of, they look like they power the nebula. Yeah, they're really bright. Mm -hmm. um, so we got another really good question here from our friend Larry, I'm gonna say his name. Oh, that guy? Oh, yeah, that guy. All right. yeah. He said, why is it we can view Venus, Mars, and Jupiter but not Mercury. We can see Mercury, just not now. Um, yeah. Now, let's see. Um, and also, it's, it's, it's hard to see even when you can see it, just because it's so close to the sun. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty faint. But you can see it. I have seen it before with my naked eye. I have. Yes. One time. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think I've, I've seen it maybe, maybe three. And um, it, it was kind of lucky. 
Uh, let me see if I can put the uh, orbit on there. So yeah, so Mercury is actually very much like Venus where it orbits closer to the sun than the earth. And when it orbits, it's even closer. So I think it only moves, I think 23 degrees away from the sun. And so much like Venus, it's also only a morning star or an evening star or sunset star. Well, not star, but planet, but you know what I'm saying. Um, but even more so, it's also dimmer than Venus. Venus is very cloudy, very reflective, and bigger than Mercury, and typically closer to us. So that's why you're going to see Venus is very, very bright. But Mercury is dimmer, smaller, typically further away and closer to the sun. So it's tough to see. In fact, when I do my videos, most months I just say, don't even, don't even try. <laughs> but there are some months where it's like, oh, no, it's actually hanging up there for a week or two. You can see it if you have a very clear view of the horizon. So... Yeah, so if you're like at the ocean and you're close to like, you know, the east or west coast and you have like a clear view of a sunset or a sunrise, like that's, that was when I saw it, I was in the Florida Keys and I was able to see it at sunset going down. So like the sun had mm -hmm. just started setting and I was able to see it, but it was really, it was still hard to do. It was very yeah. difficult because it's very, very faint. Or if you live by Amish farmland, like I do, um, and you have nice long views, or maybe you're in Iowa or something like that, you know, that, that might help too. So, all right. Oh, Joe, can mm -hmm. you, t can you talk about the, um, uh, Venus, the finding you, you know, the headlines, they found life on Venus. No, they didn't, oh. but can, spoiler, <laughs> they didn't, but can, didn't can you sort of, yeah, can you sort of get... <laughs> can I kill everyone's dreams of finding life on another planet? Yes, I can do that. Um, that's what I do. So yeah, you might have seen some headlines um, recently where uh, some people were claiming to have found a molecule on Venus that is a sign of life. Um, so they did, they found something called phosphine in Venus's atmosphere. And so Venus is a super hot planet. It's like 900 degrees Fahrenheit or something ridiculous like that. Like it's very, very hot. So we don't think there is life on the surface of Venus because it's way too hot. Like everything melts. Um, just nothing can survive there. But some scientists have been looking in the clouds of Venus and in, up in the upper atmosphere because we have found living things in our atmosphere, like little bacteria and stuff. So they're like, oh, maybe there's life in Venus's clouds. I don't know. So when they were looking, they found a signature of a molecule called phosphine. And on Earth, phosphine is a short-lived molecule. It exists. Um, it has been found. It has been found near like microorganisms that live in extreme environments. It hasn't been, it hasn't been definitively proven to be from those organisms. It has just been found around them. So some scientists have said, oh, well, maybe phosphine is a sign of life. Like that could be something like if we detect it on another planet, then we should investigate further and see if there's life there. Um, Phosphine is also pretty toxic and terrible, so we don't play with it very much here on Earth. We don't study it a lot. So there's still a lot we don't know <laughs> about that. It was just interesting to find. Now, another cool thing about phosphine is it is also found in Jupiter's atmosphere and Saturn's atmosphere. So it's not super weird that we see it in Venus's atmosphere because Venus is a cloudy planet. It does have a rocky surface, a much more solid surface than Jupiter and Saturn, but it also is full of clouds and things like that. So it's kind of cool that we see it on all, on both Jupiter and Saturn and Venus, but it's probably not life. So I don't, I don't mean to like hurt anyone's dreams or anything, but it is most likely not life. <laughs> Yep. If we, if we were betting scientists, I think we would bet on not life. Yes, on not life. No yeah. Life. Would you, 
Would you say this might be similar to, now this is going a little, little deep, uh -oh. um, but when they found faster than light neutrinos, <laughs> when they thought they found those, but it was really an instrumentation problem, do you think it's something similar to that or? I don't think it's an instrumentation problem in this case. I think it is a, we don't necessarily understand the physics going on in Venus's atmosphere. So oh. since Venus is super hot, there could be chemical reactions happening in the atmosphere that we can't understand because we don't have that system here on Earth. So it's very difficult in order for us to study anything in space, we basically have to like learn about stuff on Earth and then sort of apply it to what we see out in space because we can't actually go and like scoop out some of Venus's atmosphere and like run some tests on it. That would be really difficult. Um, we don't have the technology to do that. So we don't really have a way of studying what is happening. On, like we can guess based on what we know happens on Earth but I really think it's just something we don't know because we don't know a lot about phosphine. We don't even know if organisms on earth create it or if it's just something that shows up around them by accident, you know? So like, I think there's just a lot we don't know. So we can't really have an answer yet, but I don't think it's an instrumentation problem. I think they did find phosphine. I, I, I agree. Yeah, I don't think life. it's an instrumentation problem, but I, I know how, you know, science, so, when people write about scientific discoveries, they, they can sometimes um, not accurately represent what the certainty and, and such is. So Yeah, they get excited. And it, yeah. it's fine to get excited. That I don't hate. Yeah. But um, yeah. And either sad. way, we're going to learn a lot more about uh, phosphine. We're going to learn a lot more about how this stuff works. Yeah, hopefully. I hope there's people deciding to study that now. Yeah. Um, okay, now I do want to make sure that we get to one thing here, which is the um, Orionid meteor shower. Uh, now, the Orionid meteor shower is the 20th to the 22nd, okay? Now, as meteor showers go, this is a pretty good one. You know, it's all right. It's not the Perseids in August, which is always great. Um, it's not totally weak, but it, it's decent. Uh, if you have not light polluted skies, you will get about 15 meteors per hour. Okay. And your best chance to actually see them is on the morning of the 21st. So I'm just going to move to the 21st. It's actually not that important to look here, but um, so we're on the 21st. And so why are they called Orionids? Well, the reason is, is that all of the meteors appear to be coming from the constellation Orion. Let me switch to a different window here uh, because as a professional, I looked it up on Google image search here. Uh, you see here's Orion and here's what we call the radiant. And the radiant is essentially in Orion. But if you were to look and take a time lapse of the Orionids, they would all appear to be coming from that spot right about here. And that's why they're called Orionids. Um, Joe, did you want to talk about some of the techniques on how to look at a meteor shower pretty well? Sure, I can do that. Um, so to, to really view a meteor shower, um, you need to be in a pretty dark place. So a place where there's not a lot of light pollution. Um, that can be hard to do. Um, so that's like your first step. So go, so find a field in a dark spot. Actually, if you, um, since this is an outdoor activity, it would be pretty easy to social distance and there might be some local astronomy clubs. Sorry, cat. Um, so there might be some local astronomy clubs like having a meteor shower party or something um, that you could go to. Um, and they would most likely be in a dark place so that you can see things. Um, another thing I, li I like to do is you need to let your eyes get adapted to the dark. So when you get outside, you kind of have to just like 
sit in darkness so that your eyes get used to it. So that means like you can't look at your phone outside at night because it's going to mess up. Yeah, I know. It's going to mess up the light sensitivity in your eyes. Um, if you do absolutely have to look at your phone, there are apps that you can download that will like redden your screen. So red light is much easier on your eyes. So like if you have to have a flashlight out with you, you can get like red cellophane or red um, gels that you put over top of lights. And that will help your eyes not like, your eyes will still get a little messed up if you turn on the flashlight, but it's much easier for your eyes to like go back to being used to being in the dark. You can do the same thing and get download an app on your phone. I call, I use one called like night vision or something and it just turns my screen red. So that way when I do look at my phone, it's not like super bright and messing up my night vision. Um, you will also need to bundle up because it's cold when you're sitting outside in the dark waiting for meteors. Um, <laughs> And you have to be patient because, especially if there's only 15 an hour, that's not a huge amount. So you're going to be waiting a long time. Like that's an average. So you're going to be waiting a long time to see a meteor. But if you get lucky and there's like a super big one, it's the coolest thing you've ever seen. And there'll be different colors. Like I've seen green meteors before. It's really cool. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I hope it's clear. Is the, I, I guess the moon, is going to be what, like? Um, I think it's going to be, well, what, it's the 15th. It's going to be a quarter moon, yeah. maybe. So, wait, wait, I got it. <laughs> this is why I write these things down. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a first quarter moon, a little bit less. So, as long as you get out there later yeah. at night or get up early in the morning, it, it's a pretty good year. There are years where it's a full moon, and it's like, ah, forget it. Yeah. But I'm, I'm with you, Joe. You really do have to, you have to dedicate at least 15 minutes and just say, look, I'm going to sit here for 15 minutes. I don't care if I get cold or you bundle up and you just dedicate yourself to that 15 minutes and just, if you don't see anything, who cares? You're looking at the sky. You're looking at the stars, you know? Yeah. So, You'll see other cool stuff. Yes. Maybe. Yes. Um, in fact, I remember one time I was driving to school and I saw what's called a fireball where this thing sort of like, it took about five seconds to burn up in front of me as I was driving, not right in front of me, you know, in the night, in the sky in front of me, but it sort of broke apart and, and you can go onto the American Meteor Society, I think it is, uh, and they have a whole reporting thing. But anyway, um, I do want to get to the, const do a quick little constellation tour, but are there other questions? Yes, somebody asked why meteor showers happen. Do you know what causes the Orion Nid meteor shower? I don't know that one off the top of my head. I don't know that one off the top of my head either, but I do know, well, do you know? Do you want to take this one? I don't, I don't know about the Orionids themselves. I just know that a lot of them are, so comets, when they go around the sun, they make these weird orbits, right? So they like come from really far out and then they come in and they get really close to the sun and then they go back out. So when they do that, part of their path overlaps with Earth's path at some point. And comets are just full of like dust and ice and they fall apart as they get closer to the sun because they get heated up and they start like spewing off all this ice and dust and stuff. And so they leave like a little trail as they go around the sun. And so the part of their trail that intersects with Earth's orbit, Earth will like pass through that trail and all those little particles will hit our atmosphere and burn up and be meteors. And if there's like really big chunks that are sitting there, they'll burn up in our atmosphere and we'll see a bunch of meteors. Um, so that's one way that they happen. Um, but I don't know if the Orionids are caused by a comet or not, or if they're. I think they else. are. I'm pretty sure they are, but. Um, I can Google it. I'm going to Google it. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're professional astronomers here, so we use Google. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Let's see. Um, I am 
showing my screen there. Okay. Um, oh, and I, from Haley's Comet. Is it Haley's Comet? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. It's from Haley's I, Comet. I knew one of them was Haley's. Yeah, but. I didn't realize it was the Orion though. So that's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, it looks like we got about 10 minutes left. So I do want to make sure we get to the uh, um, constellations a little bit. So we have been looking at, I want to see if my laser pointer, oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. All right. So there's Saturn. There's Jupiter. Uh, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn 90 degrees around, okay? And because I have so many cables here, <laughs> it's not going to be the best visual. But here we go. All right. So we are looking north. Let's see. Ah, okay. So if we look north, there's the light cloud of uh, redding, okay? Uh, but if you look north and you look most of the way up, maybe a halfway up to the sky, you will be able to see one, two, three, four, five stars. And this whole thing here is Cassiopeia, okay? That is the queen. It's pretty easy to find in the northern sky. And what will happen is throughout the night, this is actually going to move up and it will actually turn. And so throughout the night, it'll get higher. And then by the morning, it'll be on the opposite uh, end of the sky. Um, so that is Cassiopeia. And if you see how it sort of faces this way um, toward the left, let's see if I can get Cepheus here. Oh, let's skip Cepheus for tonight. Let's move over to, ah, uh, now, if I had a class right now, I'd say bonus points to whoever can identify that constellation right there. But I don't have a class right now, so I'm going to say this constellation here is the Little Dipper, also known as Ursta Minor, okay? What you have here is the tail, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stars that make a small ladle or cup in the night sky. And I'd also say, hey, bonus points if you know what star that is. And I'll give you a hint. It's the most important star in the sky, but it's not the brightest. It's Polaris, the North Star. And the reason that's important is that every other star rotates around Polaris because our axis of the Earth is pointed almost directly at Polaris. And you notice that these inside four stars are actually fairly dim. They're a good measurement of how much light pollution you have. In fact, I can see it better through my camera right now than I can see it with my eyes. Now, Joe, um, can you see those middle stars on the on the feed there? Um, kind of. Kind of. I mean, they're faint. Like, if you point at them, I think people can okay. see them. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that'll do. Um, and then, uh, okay, let's see. What else should I look at for constellations? Oh, I know. We got to look straight up. Okay. Because straight up is where most people look when they just go outside. And then we'll, we'll pause for a couple more questions. Okay. And I'm going to take this off the tripod. So if it's a little shaky, that's because I'm a little shaky. But if you look pretty much straight up, you should be able to find this constellation right there. And it kind of looks like a cross. Um, let's see if I can do the laser and the camera at the same time. Oh. I'm getting all kinds of talented here now. All right. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six stars that make sort of a northern cross. That is Cygnus the swan. And if you look at it as a swan, this is the head, this is the tail, and these are the wings. But if I turn the camera around, you can see more of the wings. 
you can see, there's my laser pointer. That was that upper star. There's another one over here. And so the wings sort of make this whole left wing and right wing, okay? Um, and then near that, see I'm losing my, there we go. The brightest star in the summer sky is Vega, which is part of that constellation right there, which is Lyra the Harp. See that trapezoid right there? I think that's one of the most gorgeous things. Um, and you know what? I think I'll stop there because I could go on for hours if we did this. So, um, Joe, are there other questions? Um, I think your cat not, has a question. Not about astronomy, but <laughs> people are okay. coming. Oh, my ridiculous cat is being <laughs> obnoxious right now. <laughs> I mean, they're really good at that, you know? <sighs> She was like over there sleeping this whole time. Like mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if she's showing everyone her board hole. I apologize. I mean, as you can tell, my dog was perfectly, perfectly behaved. Yes, he was. This whole time because he was on another level of the house, but. <laughs> um, He's good. Okay. Yeah, I don't see any other questions. Um, or requests or no requests. Nope. All right, and uh, let me just see. Is there anything else that I wanted to talk about? I think you guys just got a couple more questions. There okay. we are. Is Starry Night available to every everyone? Oh, okay. I'll start off talking about Starry Night, and then Joe, you know what you want to talk about. Yeah. Um, so Starry Night is technically available to everyone with money. So um, I did buy it through my school, but you can also get an enthusiast version of it. And it is pretty intense. Um, it, it's kind of like the Swiss Army Knife with a lot of tools on it. Um, but there is a very simpler and very much more free version. Joe, did you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, I put it in the chat. It's called Stellarium, and it is very similar to Starry Night. Um, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but if you just want a program that tells you, like, when the planets are up and, like, how far away they are and what else is in the sky, you can do the same thing where, like, you can zoom in and out, and when you click on objects, it'll tell you, like, how far away they are and how bright they are. Um, and you can pick any date and look at what's up in the sky and put in your location. So it's very similar to Starry Night. Um, and it's free and it works on Mac, PC, and Linux. <laughs> so hey, Linux, you nerd. <laughs> I don't have Linux anymore, but I did. Okay. Um, and yeah, somebody, okay, somebody got your YouTube channel in there. That's good. Cause somebody asked. Hey, about that. nice job. Oh, um, if you're looking for an app, um, the one that I like to use the most with my son um, is Sky View Free, and I just put it in the chat as well. Um, it's really simple. Um, it actually shows a camera view of what you're looking at with the constellations over top of it. Um, I don't know. That's just the one that uh, engaged his interest the most out of all of them uh, because, of course, I have a lot of them. Um, yeah, so... I, I would suggest um, that if you're looking for a phone one, there are more complicated ones out there too. Mm -hmm. And then oh, somebody, you know, somebody actually asked if there's presentations like this at the Dickinson Observatory and that I don't know. I mean, there used to be when I was, when I was there, yeah. but I think because of COVID, they're probably not doing that right now. Yeah. I'll probably would, as the voice from beyond and answer that, that yes, during times when uh, our students are on campus, yes, there are planetarium shows that our students do. And during special weekends on campus, like homecoming and family weekend and alumni weekend, we always try to make something happen at the planetarium. Um, so yes, if, once we hopefully get back to some semblance of normalcy, people can come enjoy these at the, uh, the Dickinson planetarium as well. But Rob's YouTube channel is a great resource in the meantime. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I know just in my planetarium at a, at a public school, like we 
can't have people other than students at the school. So we're out of luck. And so that's actually why part of why I'm doing this, because I'd like to be able to reach out to my community uh, in a different way. So um, there was another question in here that I, I don't know if you answered this uh, some other way, Joe, but one was talking about um, uh, satellites and why we yeah. can see them. I kind of answered it. Okay. But um, you can answer it too. <laughs> okay, sounds good. We'll see if we match. Um, <laughs> So the reason you can see satellites and the International Space Station is because the, um, uh, they have solar panels typically or shiny surfaces, but usually solar panels. And what they do is as they're, if, if this is the earth, as they're coming up and coming out of orbit, and let's say the sun is over here, their solar panels will hit, will reflect the sun's light at just the perfect angle that it'll kind of hit you on the ground. Now it is a broad you know, space that it's hitting, but basically they're reflecting the sun's light. They're like giant mirrors uh, in the sky reflecting the light. So that's why you're able to see them. And that's also why you'll really only see them in like an hour after the sun sets or an hour or two after the sun sets, an hour or two before the sun sets, because otherwise they're in the shadow and there's no sunlight to reflect. So, but yeah, look for like ISS detector on your phone. It gives me um, automatic uh, alerts that tells me when, when it's happening. So I get a text really message. Cool. Nice. I get text message from net. It's like spot the station or something. Yeah. It's a website. Mm -hmm. You can put in your cell phone number and it'll ask you for like where you live and it will text you when you can see the space station. It's usually in the really early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> or at night actually we, we've had yeah. ones uh in the evening lately so but they kind of yeah, come in, in little spurts yeah they do yeah but most of the time it's like 4 a.m and i'm like no, <laughs> no <thanks. laughs> i'm asleep yeah <laughs> um cool any other any other questions or requests or um i don't see any anymore right now well it is eight o'clock and and yeah. you think you answered all the questions so with that i just want to thank everyone for attending and thank you two so much for for doing this for dickinson tonight this was wonderful i loved how many questions you were and thank you to everyone for being such an engaged audience hopefully we can do this again sometime yeah It'd be a pleasure. <laughs> and one day, one day in person again. So uh, yes, we can do it at the at the Dickinson Planetarium. Yes. Yeah. Oh. At the observatory on the I roof. Haven't, I haven't been there in so long. I know. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for attending tonight. And we hope we'll see you at another program very soon. And be sure All to right. follow, follow Rob's YouTube page and Instagram. It is a great place for both adults and kids to learn more about what's going on in the world. Or in the sky, I guess. <laughs> yep, I'm putting the two usernames that I use in the in the chat now. Um, so yeah, feel free to follow and and I love interacting with people about this stuff. So don't be afraid to send me a message of what's that. <laughs> I love it. Dickinsonians are curious forever. So thank you for for making that possible. All right, have a wonderful night, everybody. All right, good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>